Hey guys, this is John, this is Phil. We're here to talk on Forward Talk today about eschatological models. Certainly this is a subject that many of us, many people have approached us to talk about eschatology in general. What you will not hear today is our opinions uh, on eschatological, eschatological models, but what you will hear is just a brief rundown of the various different views in regards to eschatology. Um, and this is important to know and to understand because I find many times people have an understanding that's sort of, um, that's sort of a hybrid understanding. They take bits and pieces from different eschatological uh, views that, that just don't mesh together. Yeah. And so today we're simply going uh, to, to sort of give you a brief rundown of some of the large major eschatological views in that exists today. So you have, of course, your large categories of pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, in terms of when Jesus is going to uh, come in relationship to the tribulation. You have your major millennial models like pre-mill, a-mill, and post-mill mm -hmm. views of, of the millennial reign of Christ. And you have um, you have uh, some other fringe eschatological models that kind of stray from those, but those are the kind of the primary categories that that most people are going to kind of fit into, and the preterist view as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you you also get to talk about dispensational views. Yes, as well. Exactly. Um, the idea of dispensations versus covenant theology versus covenant theology, and that is that is all. Uh, so very important to understanding the end time, <clears throat> um, but not just the end time. It also gives you the view of the church, God Himself, God Himself, and so in eschatology, I'm not so much about the future. I'm about the now. I'm about yeah. the here and now. How am I viewing God? How am I viewing the cross? Yeah. How do I view my relationship with Him? How do I view the bride in relationship yeah. to Christ? And of course, how do I view my future hope? What will that look like? Yeah. So on and so forth. And so I think it's very important to at least know why you believe what you believe and yes. understand the different models that are out there today. And but, I, I think something that's important, at least from my perspective, is that you know, I reject the idea that there is an eschatological orthodoxy, that somehow this one particular, particular narrow model is what you have to fit into in order to be in the eschatological orthodoxy. Within the apostolic movement, there are guys that are dispensational, there are guys that are covenant theology, there, there are guys that are pre, there are guys that are uh, mid, that are post-trib, there are guys that are pre-mill, pre a-mill, post-mill. I, I, have, I have apostolic friends that fit into every one of those categories. And so I think for me a big deal is the idea that I reject that there is, an, there is an eschatological orthodoxy that if you don't fit into one narrow model, then, then you're somehow not teaching, you're teaching false doctrine about eschatology. And I just think it's important that we not view whatever es eschatological model that someone holds, that we not view it as a kind of a salvific type issue. Sure. And so, of course, today we're not really going to talk about our opinions and where we no. stand on certain issues. Um, but I, I will say that even over the course of the many years that I've been involved and interested in, in eschatology, I have noticed that even people that I, I disagree with on their eschatological views, that many times they have the same view of the here and now as I do. Yeah. Even though if we were to dig into our eschatological views, uh, I don't know if it would be uh, cohesive to with their... what they claim they... they um believe in terms of what their model is. Correct. So Correct. in other words, they, they may hold a uh, pre-mill, pre-trib, dispensational model in terms of what they articulate their view is, but how they see the church 
in victory right Correct. now exactly. is in conflict with what that particular model has to say about the church. Right. And so that's, that's where it becomes important that, of course, all theology is practical. There's no such mm -hmm. thing as theology that's simply uh, relegated to the theoretical. Whatever you believe about God mm -hmm. is going to impact how you live in the world. And so for, for that reason, eschatology is important because how you see the purpose and the plan of God unfolding in the world is going to affect how you live right now, how you see the victory of the church, how you see all of that is going to be affected by eschatology. So why don't we talk about pre-trib dispensationalism? That, that would probably be the, uh, I don't know if it's the, the largest model, Today? It's the predominant. It's the predominant North American model, although it is it is shrinking in, in popularity. Yes, it is definitely losing steam, but it is the predominant North American. But model. it gains such popularity and notoriety by if you're familiar with these the title of these books, like the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. Yeah, that's uh, the that's the new kind of pop culture version of yes. pre-trib dispensational, where you have a Antichrist character by the mm -hmm. name of Nikolai Carpathia and the whole secret rapture of millions of people disappearing out of airplanes and, yes. and graves. And then you have this seven-year period where people have an opportunity during the tribulation to, to get saved and to be ready for the second coming. And so in the pre-trib model, there's a clear distinction between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture occurs prior to a seven-year tribulation, a second coming occurs after the seven-year tribulation. There was a Christian movie in the 70s. I don't know if you've, you're even familiar with this, but there was a Christian movie in the 70s that came out, and it was called A Thief in the Night. Okay. And I remember a lot of churches showed that movie, and it was sort of along the same lines as the Left Behind series. Yeah. So people were gone, they vanished, so on and so forth. Now, of course, Tim LaHaye took it to the next level and, and really uh, dramatized it and, yeah. and um, obviously made a, a big story of it. But so the model of, of pre-trib dispensationalism is obviously that the Lord would come back. Prior to the seven-year tribulation. Prior to a seven-year tribulation. And that would be not just tribulation, but that would be great tribulation. Yeah, the great tribulation. The great tribulation. Yeah. So then mid-trib would be that the Lord would come back three and a half years yes. into tribulation. Yes. And, it, and of course, it's all built up on the idea that the tribulation is a seven-year period. Correct. And so mid-tribulation... Um, ideas that he occur that the second coming occurs three years into that seven year right period. and so great the great tribulation is is from Daniel yeah okay it would be Daniel's seventieth uh, week yes so Daniel's seventieth week would be the seven years of great tribulation yes based upon the pre trib dispensational model and of course they have the first sixty nine weeks occurring consecutively. Yes. However, there's a massive gap between the 69th and the 70th week. Almost, in, two, I mean, close to 2,000 years. 2,000 years and counting, Yeah. basically. Close, close to it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so you, you have Jesus taking the church out, the Gentile church, mm -hmm. because in dispensationalism, you have two peoples of God, two peoples, two plans, Two destinies, mm -hmm. and so you have this this uh, uh, perpetual distinction between Jews, uh, uh, Israel, and the church. Correct. And so he 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 raptures out the Gentile bride mm -hmm. prior to a seven year tribulation. So then mid tribulation would be the same same exact thing, except they're they're gone during. Yeah, under the, the big middle. umbrella. Post trib says. Years. Post-trib says that the church will be here through the entire period of a... Some post-tribbers are seven-year tribulation guys. Mm -hmm. Other post-tribbers are... Like my father is, is a three-and-a-half-year tribulation guy. So he sees three-and-a-half years of tribulation, three-and-a-half years of what he calls the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. And so... And the church would be gone before the wrath of God. No, yeah. no, 
the church will be here through the entire seven year period, okay. even during the wrath of God. That's However, they will be preserved okay. from the wrath of God. Okay. So, so the tribulation for him is the wrath of man. Okay. The wrath of God is a is a, the latter half of that that uh, three and a half year period. The church is here, but preserved from it, similar to how the Israelites were protected in Goshen from the wrath see, of yes. God against okay. the uh, against the Egyptians. And there's that, and that's sort of a, a hybrid view. Yeah, it's sort of a very unique view of, of eschatology. That's however, not mainstream. How, exactly. However, most post-tribbers are not going to see a distinction between Israel and the church. Most post-tribbers that I know see like a, a text like Galatians six sixteen when mm-hmm. it talks about yes. the Israel of God. Right. Most most post-tribbers are going to see that. Um, the church is made up of both Jew and Gentile with Correct. no distinction. I was raised post-trib, so I'm very familiar. I was with raised that. with most tri- post-trib was, as well. I was raised with that ideology as well. Yeah. Matter of fact, I believe that fueled um, just the idea that what the church are, and Israel are one. Yeah, uh, sort of fueled our eschatological views. Yeah. Um, Speaking of eschatology, it's kind of interesting how we met that first time. Yes. When I preached for you in December of 2015, like I think it was like three minutes into sitting down at Longhorn, we were we were uh, headlong into eschatology, just blown away of how, how similar our views were. Our views were very similar. Um, this was without us really, we didn't know each other. I mean, that was the first time we ever talked. And it was sort of amazing to see that we had a lot of the same views and, and uh, ideas concerning yeah. eschatology. Um, yeah, we we talked about that for I mean I think that your whole visit exactly that time in my basement, uh, in my house, in several different places. So you have pre-trib, you have mid-trib, you have post-trib. Yes. And then when you get into the millennial views, the millennial comes from the idea of millennium a, a thousand years. Um, so there's three major views on the millennium. The first one is um, a pre-mill uh, view of the millennium. Mm-hmm. And uh, so what that says is that the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to occur, to occur prior to the a reign. literal thousand-year yes. millennial reign where a, the physical man Christ Jesus sits on a literal throne of David in the city Correct. of Jerusalem and reigns for... A literal thousand, and that, years. that's the, probably the most predominant view in Christianity today. Yeah, but that is yeah the most predominant view of say the last hundred years. Yes, correct. It wasn't the predominant today. view going back. No, in ancient times, it's 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 kind of like an old uh, boy band. It's the new new kid on the block. Mm-hmm. So uh, then you have the A mill still hanging op- tough. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and so you have the the a mill or a mill view yeah. of the millennial, uh, which um, which sees that the the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand years, is not a literal thousand years, and that the the reign of Christ occurs spiritually in the heavens as as saints die disembodied souls go go to heaven and they reign with Christ in the heavenly. So Correct. this is kind of an A-mill view uh, that that sees the, the uh, present work of the church uh, within the millennial reign of Christ as mm-hmm. not really, um, um, it's not a, vi- it's, it's what post-mill would say, it's a pessimistic eschatology mm-hmm. that the church is still going to have experienced massive defeat uh, in the real world while the departed saints are experiencing victory um, in a disembodied state, reigning with Christ right. spiritually in the heavens. Whereas the post mill view sees the millennial reign of Christ as having real victorious impact mm-hmm. uh, in the world. So the post mill view is going to say that there's going to be a continued expanse of Christianity throughout history until. To the place that Christianity is going to influence every area of society, 
It doesn't say that necessarily everybody's going to convert and be Christians. It doesn't say that. However, it does say that Christianity is going to affect mm -hmm. every aspect of the culture and that after this thousand-year period, Christ is going to return to a victorious church at the end of this um, uh, millennial reign. And so even within the post-mill view, you have two major categories. You have the people who think that the thousand years is a is not a literal thousand years. And I'll explain here in a moment how they arrive at that. And, but you have another post-mill view that says the church is going to, to experience uh, victory through evangelism yes. to the point that it'll, it will initiate initiate a literal thousand year mm -hmm. period of peace that precedes the second coming of Christ. And when that literal thousand years has ended, Christ will return. And so the way that the ah mill or the non-literal post mill guys approach the idea of the thousand years from, I believe it's Revelation 20, is that you have text from the Old Testament that says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Right. And so the point that they make is that that doesn't mean that hill 1,001, 2, 3, and above, he doesn't own those cattle. It's that thousand is the largest increment in Scripture. So to say that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills is to say that he owns all the cattle on all the hills. Right. And so the thousand-year reign of Christ simply means that that Christ reigns in victory for an extended period of time. It isn't necessarily a literal thousand year reign. Correct. And then there's several different beliefs, um, unique beliefs as it would relate to that uh, progressive millennial uh, view. And there's several different beliefs, and so we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, but then uh, talk about preterists, preterism. So preterism is uh, a word that simply means past, a full or what's called a hyper preterist. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's a preterist that suffers from ADD, ADHD or whatever, but it, they call them hyper preterist. A hyper preterist or full preterist is uh, the person that believes all biblical prophecy was fulfilled um, leading up to and culminating in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Mm -hmm. So the second coming of Jesus occurred in the first century. Um, all of the prophecies in the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, Luke 13, I'm sorry, Mark 13, Luke 21, all of those prophecies were fulfilled in the first century and that there are no biblical prophecies left to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. The idea is the resurrection has already happened um, and that actually there will be no end to the earth. They use text from Ecclesiastes that says things like the earth is forever. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is no end that the world will continue in perpetually in the state that we are currently in. Yeah. Then you have what is called a partial preterist view that views some of the prophecies of Scripture in the past, but views all of the prophecies about the second coming of Christ, uh, the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, views, a, uh, views that there is a future physical bodily Resurrection of the dead, second coming of Jesus. However, the events about the destruction, uh, the great tribulation they see as being fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So that's a partial preterist view. So while it's partial preterist, it's also partial futurist. Correct. And there's, again, several varying degrees. Yeah, there are nuances within all of these camps. Right. These are just the big picture, uh, kind of the broad brush. And so then I think it's important that we explain dispensationalism as well. And we probably should have done this at the beginning of the show, but we can do it now. Yeah. Um, because it is something that is set apart. It's separate. It's, yeah. it's sort of on its own, but it does affect especially the pre-trib uh, view, post, and mid. Yeah. So uh, explain dispensationalism. Well, dispensationalism is the, uh, the idea that God deals with man progressively throughout time in different most ways. Model, different ways in most models mm -hmm. there are seven dispensations beginning mm -hmm. with <clears throat> Adam and Eve in the garden innocence the dispensation of innocence after they sinned mm -hmm. uh, they they knew that they had sinned 
so this is very of conscience. I think this will be very familiar to a lot of different yeah. people if you've taught search for truth Bible study exploring God's word exploring God's word it's all yeah. kind of built off of the idea of dispensation so you have the dispensation of grace you have the millennial was I believe in most of the models the final dispensation mm -hmm. in dispensational models uh, they say that each one of the the seven or eight depending on which one you look at all of the dispensations end in failure and <clears throat> um, so <laughs> I, I've often joked that dispensationalism could also be named God's seven failures because all seven dispensations end in, end in failure. Mm -hmm. But it's just seven different ways in which God progressively deals with man throughout human history. Right. And then you have the covenant theology side. Mm -hmm. uh, that would reject dispensationalism. Yes. Because what dispensationalism does is, is it, it actually is the, the fuel. It is the, the, the ideology that, that makes the church and... Israel today running parallel to each other. Yeah. So different, two different people, two different purposes, two different promises. Two different destinies. Destinies, yes. And Larkin would actually say... Clarence Larkin, that is, yeah. Yeah, Clarence Larkin would actually say not only two people, who, two who would Who would almost be known as the father of, of pre-trib dispensation. Yes. He, he, puts, he put much of the structure to it. Yes. And so... <clears throat> So he would say not only are there two plans, two peoples, two destinies, but he would argue that it requires two divine persons. Yes. Because Israel and the church are separate and distinct people that they he makes, to God he the, makes the argument that Israel is the bride of God the Father mm -hmm. and the church is the bride of God the Son. Which, mm -hmm. which, which even there, there have been attempts made to what I would say apostolicize dispensationalism. Yes. But to me, to me, there is a somewhat of a conflict there because once you keep Israel and the church as two distinct peoples, uh, it becomes problematic that if they are two distinct brides, Israel was an Old Testament bride or one bride, uh, Gentiles or the church is one bride, even within the idea of oneness theology, if you have one person, Jesus Christ, having two distinct brides, ultimately having them at the same time in, at some point in the future. That uh, would give credence to Mormonism. <laughs> yes, sir. So Bishop, he's the Bishop of our souls. Yes. And of course, uh, Paul argues that a bishop must be the husband of one wife. There it is. And so, so these are kind of the big picture um, takes on the various eschatological models. Yep. So it's important when, um, you know, really diving into a view that, that you're going to say, this is my view, it's important to understand. What the implications of that and is. And the nuances are of these particular views and models. And so um, we're going to have some links in the bottom where you can go check this out for yourself, uh, some recommended reading on, on yeah. a few of them. We'll, we'll, prob we'll have included in uh, the show notes uh, links to people who hold um, these various positions, and you can do some research on your own. Yeah. Well, until next time, I'm Phil. He's John. God bless you. We'll see you soon. God bless. Stay awake, stay awake, stay awake.